today we're going to talk about Carton. Most of what I'm talking about is me using Carton. However, I'm also abusing Docker in a really, inter I think, a kind of interesting way and a way that I'm a little ashamed of. And I'm also abusing Circle CI, and so both of those are in, in the talk topic. So, good morning, Pearl. Uh, today, I want to talk about how you manage dependencies. I have uh, been managing dependencies for various years in various situations. Uh, mostly what I talk about these days is Bugzilla, but I want to mention that I've actually worked on other things before. I've worked on a thing called LAN POS, which if, for the French speakers in the room I think is an amusing name. This was created by a, an American, and uh, the, since we're in Belgium, the, the translation would be this. Um, and, but for the English speakers, we're, and since we're in English, of course it's called the ASS POS, and which is really funny because you might not know, but it, POS is frequently an acronym for that, so it's also well, that, a piece of poo. So packaging. I've done, I did packaging when I worked on this, on this point of sale machine. I did uh, Debian packaging. And, um, oh, and there's one more thing. There's some of the worst Perl code that I have ever seen. This is how it rounded numbers. So I did packaging on this thing. I used, uh, used DH make Perl. And I, I made, I think that was something, a couple hundred uh, different packages, things that weren't in Debian at the time, and I needed them. Uh, and I did a lot of work on this, but this was all for the developer machines uh, because everyone else was using, um, well, the production machines. They looked like that, and they ran, uh, ran Red Hat 4, not Red Hat Enterprise Linux 4, like older than that, like Red Hat 4. This was in the early 2000s. And, uh, but the cool thing is that somebody else worried about RPMs. So I didn't, I didn't have to worry about that. I knew about CPAN uh, 2 RPM, but I never had to deal with it. Uh, and at the time, at the time I was doing this, I was very much in the camp of uh, using the system Perl and using, uh, our, uh, using packaging that the system provides for all your Perl modules, even if you have hundreds of them. So then I, I joined Infinity, uh, and I, I worked with some really cool superheroes. And um, they, at Infinity Day, we didn't use the packaging management for most of the projects that I worked on anyway. We just used CPAN or CPANM, and it was really great. I did notice that when I was installing stuff for this work code that most of the modules came from this man who cannot be here, but I, that, like my first day when I realized I'm installing like 70 things that are all from one person, it was, it was a bit interesting when I made that correlation. But then I started working for Mozilla, and that was really exciting. I'm like, I really love working for Mozilla. Mozilla is wonderful. Uh, I got to work on Bugzilla, which is uh, the bug tracker, and it's incredibly important. And it's, it's difficult to characterize uh, my experience is working at Mozilla on Bugzilla. It's, it's incredibly difficult. It's like it's a whole complicated situation, uh, but it's been fun. So uh, Bugzilla, um, I'm going to provide a little bit of background about why, the cart, why using Carton for this was uh, an uphill battle. And so I want to tell about my first impressions for using, for using it. My first actual impression for, using, for doing Bugzilla four years ago was that I had to learn BZR. What the hell is BZR? It's some, it was some kind of source control thing. I had to use it for about a year, but we migrated off of that and we're on Git now. The second thing, as a Perl programmer that like, had been working for people that do like, modern Perl stuff, or like Steven, uh, that I was this check setup thing that's in the Bugzilla directory. And I was like, what is that? Is that like makefile.pl? No, it's not like makefile.pl. How do we specify dependencies? Bugzilla had its own way of specifying dependencies. Uh, which was a constant defined in some module, and it, it was kind of interesting because it specified the package name, uh, the module name, and also the distribution name. And as far as I know, usually those, there's not, those aren't a one-to-one -one mapping, like in the pause indexer, but most people don't care about the distribution name. They care about the, they depend on a particular package, and if the package moves between distributions, that's fine. This actually was a problem in Bugzilla when LWP split out some of their modules, but... Uh, I do rest. So the next headache was install module.pl, which was this thing that the documentation recommended to not use, but they still shipped with it. Uh, what it was was a custom CPAN client that's actually being generous. It kind of had copy and pasted parts of CPAN PM. And uh, it installed stuff into the directory uh, on the root called lib. So I wanted to point out that the code for Bugzilla, actually still now until Tom submits a patch to me to, to fix this, is in the root. And everything that we, every third, used to be every third party dependency was in lib. Now that is actually kind of backwards. And that is the code that accomplished that. Uh, we had a really fun experience with Moo because back in an older version of Moo, Moo thought that all of our code 
that, w that was like a library and all of the code in lib was first party and so warnings and things were turned on the wrong way. Uh, those, that got fixed though. Uh, so since then I've been working on creating new problems and one of the, my, I think the new problems are good. They're kind of like an investment. Um, you get rid of the old problems and you have new ones. And so the first thing I want to talk about uh, that was a problem that I've solved and created uh, was con inconsistent environments. And then we had inconsistent environments for my Bugzilla. The Bugzilla I'm talking about is the install. It's bugzilla.mozilla.org, uh, to be clear. But the, it's most, of, most of what I talk about is not important to that. But production runs on CentOS 6. Actually, I think for, it runs on Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6, but uh, close enough. Um, it uses RPMs, and somebody else built the RPMs. As in my career, that's been the case. So I want to th actually thank Fubar, who has been, had been working on Bugzilla RPMs before I came there and basically knew a lot about what the dependencies were. Uh, more, a little, I think in some cases a bit more than the developers did themselves. So then the developers use Fedora. So if you had like a, you have a VM on your desktop using VirtualBox or a VMware, something like that, it would be running Fedora. And this is the other two people that were working on Bugzilla. Um, I think actually sometimes they're using CentOS 7, but Fedora, CentOS 7, not the same as production. But it's, it gets better because um, the way they install modules, we, sometimes we installed RPMs and sometimes we use CPanM. Uh, of course, they use CPanM. Uh, I think originally they would have to use the CPan, use CPanM by specifying every module, which you could get by repeatedly running check setup and collecting the modules that it requires. Uh, at some point, there was a shim to module build, uh, and at that point, they could use CPanM, but it was still kind of really bad. So by the way, continuous integration, we've been running continuous integration tests for a long time, and those ran in CentOS 7, uh, which is good to be one version ahead of your production environment. Uh, but then a, a thing happened. There's this repository called Version Control Tools, which is a bunch of tools related to Firefox development and so on. And a coworker of mine uh, created a test thing. Oh, is there a typo there? No, it's not a typo. Uh, created a testing suite to test uh, an application that we were using called uh, Review Board against our Bugzilla because we had this integration stuff in it. And so he went and he created, we had a Docker container at this time, but he didn't use that. He went and created his own based on Ubuntu 14.04. And um, then at some point, we also had Amazon Linux, although this is, has gone away. So we had about five different systems, and each of them were installing, Debian, uh, installing CPAN packages in a different way, including Debian ones, and that was kind of fun. So just to relax for a moment, I didn't actually set out to solve the problem of having a bunch of different environments. I wanted, didn't want to solve it. I had a different problem. My problem is that laptops don't like me, and I have hardware failure all the time. Not, not literally all the time, but like enough that it's been annoying. So, oh snap, my laptop's broke. That's annoying. How long is it going to take me to reinstall Bugzilla? Well, a day or two? About two years ago, this would be a true statement. So I, at some point, I started just using, uh, because we had the module build shim on our own dependency specification, I started using that. Uh, and then to get it to work so I didn't have to modify every file, because at one point I was modifying every file to use local lib, uh, every entry point into the code, which is like every script and every, uh, not every CGI, because we're actually just a mod Perl application that's pretending to be CGI. But um, yeah, so I, I uh, tried patching all the files with local lib. That didn't work. I asked, at some point, I do remember asking, can we use local lib? And this was at the time when there were, there were, I was just jun kind of junior on the team. And I asked, and they, the answer was, was pretty much no. Uh, so we don't use local lib. Uh, so what I did ask is, how about I add uh, the local lib Perl 5 directory uh, to, uh, to the top of every, every non-module file? And uh, that patch got applied, so I did that. Uh, so we weren't using local lib, but we were loading all of the modules from the local directory, the same, which is the same directory that Carton uses, by the way. Uh, I had wanted to use Carton, but I didn't bring it up until much later. So we're not using local lib, but we have local lib, local lib Perl 5 in our path. Uh, next thing, I want to bundle. I want to use, I want every module that I'm using nicely packaged. And I want to use Carton. I've been looking forward to doing this. I had used Carton before, previous to Bugzilla, and I was excited to get back to having like a complete specification of all my dependencies. Uh, which Carton, if you do not want, I, if you do not want Carton provides, we will have a bit of time for Q 
Q&A on that. But anyway, so the Carton documentation disagrees. The Carton documentation says that uh, A, you can't use the system Perl if it's on certain systems. So this basically means Red Hat uh, because they split off core modules. Um, it also says that you can't run it without using Carton Exec. And this is also not true, and I think this is known and agreed to not be true. However, A, A is basically true. Like, you really shouldn't use the system Perl to, you can, if you try to use the system Perl with Carton and install stuff, it's going to get confused and it's going to think modules that are core modules are not core modules and it's, it's just not going to work. But you can fix this. So what you can do is you can build your own Perl that's the same version as the system one. So this is a script called uh, Bill, uh, Perl, Bill, using Perl Build. The script is called Build Vanilla Perl, which I wrote. And uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but this is taking the Perl version number and running Perl Build on whatever that version is with some flags that I think are vaguely compatible with what uh, the distro I was testing this on worked with. Uh, on multiple distros, actually. So then you, you have this, uh, you have your own Perl, you install Carton to that, into that Perl, uh, and then you have Carton install all of its dependencies, and you have Carton fat pack itself. That means that the Carton executable gets put into a directory inside the local directory that it manages. Um, and so then you just get rid of all of that. Uh, we throw away all of our hopes and dreams, and we start using the system Perl again. So we use the system Perl to reinstall Carton. This time, uh, hold on, missing a slide. And this time, we re re, uh, in the bottom part of the slide, which encapsulates the previous steps, we rerun the Carton install using the fat packed version. Uh, cache deployment basically prevents it from looking at the internet and looking and only looking at what is had is already downloaded. So it has that complete specification that it got from the real Perl in the system. Uh, not the real Perl, but the the Perl that's not messed up. Uh, so this is pretty good. This this does a few a bit of annoying steps though, and I think that it would be frustrating to do this for five different systems. So I wondered about abstracting it. I kind of think that that we could use something like a function that kind of is a function over the operating system, over the Linux distribution, and the Perl version, and the list of dependencies, and it could spit out what, the, what it is. So it would be nice to write such a function. However, it's not really possible, but we have Docker, so we could do something similar to writing a function that operates on a system. I don't know how to uh, do slides, apparently. Uh, there we go. So uh, how do we do this? Well, bad form. Uh, there we go. I apparently made subslides, and subslides are a thing I don't understand how it works. So there's a, I wanted to modify the Docker file language. I thought this would have been fun to create like a Docker file function that is parameterized over the Git repo, and then when you have that Docker file function, you could uh, have your set up the base system to match whatever production looks like, uh, and then run it. But I uh, I didn't actually end up doing that. Like I thought about it, but I did something kind of worse. I kind of wrapped Docker in Perl. Uh, well, I made a, a DSL that generates a Docker file, and that lets me use Perl subroutines uh, to to have consist to have repeatable repeatable environments. This is hard to read, but um, basically the first few lines are all setting up a CentOS six environment that matches our production. And then it calls the subroutine down at the bottom to build all of the dependencies. And um, the, end up doc, the Docker file you end up with, you can definitely not read, but I want to show for length, is, it's that. Um, the same thing is possible for Ubuntu. And then the same thing is possible for CentOS 7. And then, uh, so we have these Perl files that generate Docker files. And then, of course, we want to use make uh, to do the build process. So this builds. Docker files, and then it builds a Docker container, and then it runs the Docker container, and in running the Docker container, it produces all of a tarball of all of the dependencies as previously specified. So then I would just have a target make upload that uploads it to an S3 bucket, each of the, the tarballs for each of the different systems. 
and I just need an S3 bucket. And I asked our ops guy, I said, hey, Fubar, would you, never, would you like to never have to make an RPM for a Pro module again? And wouldn't you know it, within about 10 minutes, he had me an S3 bucket. And uh, so we do that. Uh, we updated the production push scripts to pull down um, the tarball uh, for every deployment. And um, that was cool. Now, meanwhile, version control tools, which was using their own thing uh, in Ubuntu, uh, we got them patched uh, to do that. There's the, the thing there. Uh, there was, it made it significantly shorter in lines, but it also made it faster. So the builds for testing the review board stuff, would, the slowest part was Bugzilla, and the, the slowest part of that was it building all of the dependencies using cpanm. It took, uh, I think, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Basically, I shaved 30, 37 minutes off of the, their build times. And also, they, their build stopped breaking when I added new dependencies, which I had never done. But if, in theory, if I added new dependencies, their stuff would break. Um, it also made our test run faster because I, uh, I upgraded our testing suite from, this sounds weird, but from CentOS 7 to CentOS 6 so that it was actually the same as production because I couldn't update production, but I could make continuous integration match production. Um, and I think I did Amazon Linux Docker images later after someone else created, there, there used to be Docker images that matched Amazon Linux, but now there are. And so we uh, shoved 270 modules into one carton and it fit a bit like a horse in a cup. That's not a metaphor. Um, and that's, that's the first, that was the first battle. The, the second result is once I could use, actually use CPAN modules, we could have fight smaller battles and have bigger wins. So for instance, the time in Moscow was wrong. Uh, our bug tracker is global and we have users from all over the world, including in Russia, and um, the time zone ch changed at some point and uh, the fix for that was updating date, time, time zone. So that was good. Uh, I also got to use Moo. Uh, I used Moo for generating content security policies and as it is now, my coworkers are starting to write new code that's using Moo and Bugzilla and they're actually enjoying it, which is really good. Uh, we were able to pin DVD MySQL to prevent things from breaking. Um, which happened recently. We upgraded JSON and JSONXS. I realized that we should probably have maybe be using cPanel JSONXS, which is on my roadmap. All of that's pretty boring, but basically I could update stuff. And updating stuff was something that I had wanted to do for about uh, two, this was two years ago. So I had been wanting to update stuff for about two years. But uh, more exciting than doing, than, doing up, than updating stuff is shipping features. So I had a feature request, which was make all the users of Bugzilla hate me and by making their passwords harder. And so uh, this, was, this was a very important high-level request from like, important people that wanted to make sure we were secure. So I asked EIS, which is Enterprise Information Security, what do you recommend? How do you want me to make passwords secure? And they recommended a C library. Not recommended, but they said that they were using a C library. And I'm like, oh, cool. Is there a Perl binding for that? And as it turns out, there is. There's a Perl binding for that. It needed a, an additional feature, which I, which I patched. And I want to thank uh, Sherwin, the author of that module, because I was able to ship a feature that was important to a lot of people in about a month, um, and that's that's pretty good. Uh, so, but you know what's even faster than than like shipping features faster and having being able to use new modules? What's faster than that is having a development environment that you can throw away and recreate as many times as you want. So um, I at some point created a Vagrant install. It was pretty easy. Uh, to, to get it going because all the dependencies were already packaged for CentOS 6 for production. So I just made a Vagrant VM that matched production exactly. And uh, that was pretty good. The stats for like the previous year, there were about three-ish three people contributing on average to on a given month to, to bugzilla.mozilla.org. In the last month, we've had 11. And I think that that's actually really good. Now, I'm like a majority of those commits, but uh, the second majority of it is like half, half again as much as well. It's, a nice, it's actually a nice curve, um, what you would expect pretty much. So we're actually pretty darn agile now. We, we accept pull requests. People can set up dev environments. We've, contributed, uh, we've participated in both outreach and Google Summer of Code, which meant hundreds of new people, not hundreds, but dozens of new people have tried installing it and, and getting a dev environment working. So we're really happy. Now, the, the next problem was we have a cloud migration pending. So our current production is, is CentOS 6 on like machines in the data center, and that's got to change pretty soon. And so there are people working on that. And they had some requirements, 12-factor, yada, yada, Batman. 
but they needed our app to be a Docker container, and they strongly, strongly hinted that it should be Circle CI for running our tests and for building a Docker image. Um, so I stared at this task, and I thought, well, this is a good chance to clean up some stuff. So Docker, they were recommending Circle CI, the first version, and they had experience with that. But right as I was doing the Circle CI 2 had come out, and it had a lot of shiny features, including the ability of running Docker containers. It's not literally running them inside Docker containers, but you can create and build Docker containers from what amounts to an arbitrary Docker container. And so the, the YAML that you have to write, because this is all modern mm -hmm. and basically uh, Ingi, Ingi's YAML language is one of the more popular cloud languages at this point, I think. So here is uh, a bit how we do a build. Uh, it's, notice it sets up a remote Docker environment and it builds Docker. Everything is fine. You probably want to see what that Docker file looks like. So there's the entirety of the Docker file. Nothing to see there. Very boring. Uh, I'm kind of hiding the fact that there is a cutoff by the projector. There is a thing that says from Mozilla B Team BMO Slim. So BMO Slim is our base image, and I kind of I'm obviously alighting a lot of stuff in there. So I should tell you what that looks like. Um, that is this hard to read YAML. I wish I could have changed the font colors ahead of time. But uh, this is the steps that are required to build the. Uh, the dependencies, so this is what was previously in the makefile. The makefile, by the way, is gone. Uh, we don't use the makefile to do any crazy things. I'm not generating Docker files from Perl anymore either. Uh, but these steps run, so let's take a closer look so that you can actually see. The Docker environment gets to be based on an image, which is our base image of CentOS 6. And uh, it runs a set of steps, which you can see in closer detail here. Uh, that does a checkout of the code. It installs all of the RPMs, that the system level RPMs, like libc stuff. And then it uh, does build, uh, prepare, build tar stage one, build stage two, and then it makes a tarball. So build, prepare. Build, prepare is a simple script that's basically doing the uh, downloading uh, CPAN, uh, sorry, downloading Perl build and carton. And then it's also in compiling those things. So then build stage one uses the real Perl, the nice one that we just installed to do the previously mentioned step. I think the code is a bit cleaner than the old makefile stuff. Uh, build stage two is when we remove everything and do that all again. And then uh, this kind of long spiel here is how we package all of that up. I'm actually packaging up a bit of metadata about what system libraries are linked to any shared objects that are in the Perl directory. And I check for that later to prevent uh, the case of missing, of a mismatch. In the current case, we could have a mismatch between production and uh, this build environment. In the future, that will be impossible. But at the moment, it's still possible, so I make that check. So this is how we build BMO Slim, which is, once again, you can't see very well, but it's our own, they will be on the slides. You, uh, it's based on the Docker image. So I'm running a Docker image for running Docker commands. And then inside there, it's uh, copying, uh, it's tarring up, I'm sorry, it's untarring the tarball that it had previously built uh, in, the, in the other step. And it's putting that in a directory. So Docker workflows have these directories that you can put stuff in and share between build processes. And so technically, I'm still uploading a tarball to S3, but that is for the existing production environment. And if, if all goes well, I won't have to do that anymore, and the entire build pipeline will be building all the dependencies and just putting them in the container and uploading the container to Docker Hub, and everything will be fine. So build times. Uh, there's a bit of a split here that I should explain. So there is the stuff that where I'm building and doing the interesting things with Carton is in a director in a repo called BMO Systems. And this is mostly because it takes a lot of time. Uh, technically, I only need one branch of this for product for, for the use down here. I only need the CentOS 6 to the BMO Slim pipeline. But uh, it, that one alone takes 20 minutes. So the dependencies don't change that often. So the dependencies live in, outside of the master copy of the dependencies is the repo, but there's a cached copy that's in another repo 
that is generated for each system because the actual requirements can vary between Ubuntu and CentOS and so on. Like you don't have this exact same set of dependencies. Also because you don't have the exact same version of Perl. I think there are three versions of Perl at play in this arrangement. So uh, they're separate. But when you, uh, what we, as a result of this, the build times for everything else are quite small. I think the longest test is our Selenium test, which is running a full Firefox browser. Uh, and that's, you know, that takes a bit more time because it's, it's actually hitting a few, I don't know, hundreds of pages on the thing to make sure it's not broken. Our build time, though, because everything's technically already built, is just a minute. So I kind of like that. I would like to show you uh, one of the bits about this circle CI thing that is nice. So to spin up our testing environment, I can specify an, any number or some arbitrarily large number of Docker containers that will be running. So when this is running, we have our code running in one box, uh, one container. We have uh, MySQL, and we have Memcache, we have the Selenium uh, thing. Having a container run Selenium is really nice because I don't have to worry about the details of updating that. We used to have all of this run in one container uh, back before we were using Circle, and that was not good. So that, uh, that said, it's obvious that there's a bit of a man there must be a manual step between these two repositories because if I just add something to the makefile.pl of Bugzilla, then how does it get into BMO systems and into the multiple files? Uh, so I'm going to show you what that looks like. It's still a painful process, but it's not that bad. So for instance, uh, we edit the makefile.pl, adding in the new dependency. And we have to use make. So I run make and uh, with which branch and the sets who make variables, the branch and the repository that I want it to look at, because obviously it can only have the dependencies for a particular repo at a given time, which does make deploying this a little bit difficult. Uh, you have to have some planning, but still, uh, you run the make, it runs and compiles things, creates two tarballs, and then I do a commit and I have new a new cpan file for each distribution and a new cpan file dot snapshot for each distribution uh, which those don't change so the process here is actually feeding back in on itself because the cpan file there's an artifact of the C, of carton called a cpan file dot snapshot that gets fed back in which prevents me from up upgrading packages unless i explicitly do that uh, which is not shown here there's a separate process for actually upgrading something that's not that bad, and it is documented, but it's still, this is not ideal. But having five, at this point, actually only two, different systems is also not ideal. So um, that is the monster. But I wanted to also mention that in that last patch, I have, I'm adding Mojalicious as a dependency for my Bugzilla for a couple of reasons. And if this interests anyone and they would like to to do things. I'm all ears. Uh, and I should have a sufficient amount of time for questions. And I suspect that there should be questions. And I have all of the code opened in my IDE for those. So questions? Yes? I'm going to use Modulicious to implement OAuth, uh, OAuth 2. But I'm also going to have, like, as an endpoint that I can move migrate features to. Uh, for instance, uh, the next thing I could do is we need to use JWT. I would like to use Mo uh, Mojo JWT for email confirmations uh, instead of the current token system that we're using. So. I can I I can ask myself questions if no one has any questions, but yes. The orchestration is outside of my so I just make a, a application that's roughly twelve factory, and uh, the orchestrator that the the uh, the other part of the team uses is up to them. I don't think they're using an orchestrator right now, actually. Uh, but it, theoretically, it could. I've actually got this running myself on Kubernetes, uh, so it's not hard. It's just not, it's not, my, not in my responsibilities at the moment. And if you just speak, just yell if, you're, if I don't appear to be noticing that you're asking a question. Yes? So you mentioned you were looking at using Modalicious for the OAuth 2 layer. 
Yep. Um, are you planning to spin your own, or have you planning to mobile, mobile ship put in uh, OAuth to server, which is based on Nest OAuth server? Sorry. Yeah, and this isn't the one that Lee Johnson yeah. wrote. Okay. I wondered if you'd seen that. Have you actually played with it yet? Because I've been meaning to play with it. I haven't played with it. I've looked into a uh, proof of concept just using Mojolicious itself, and then I've done another separate proof of concept of tying it to Bugzilla's auth system. So I know that these two things will work, and I haven't played with them together yet. But Lee Johnson's, oh, uh, the fact that he has packaged that up for Mojalicious, and it seems like less work than using the underlying thing, is the reason that I want to depend on Mojalicious, because I want to, I don't want to have to do a lot of work. <laughs> yep. Um, are there any questions about... Um, I think that it would be instructive, and I'll just show you. I'm going to show you the entire config file for built for the entire workflow that generates the the carton files. And how are we on time? What? Ten. Ten. Perfect. This is exactly the amount of time. I was hoping for a little bit more questions after all of this madness, but um, this is fine. So the entire we have just under. About about 200 lines of YAML, the world's best scripting language, and and I think that should be visible on the screen. How's that? And a much larger font. Look at that. That's amazing. There we go. Oh. I wish I had a Linux machine in front of me. I would know how to do that then. But then I won't be able to see it. Bingo. And now I need to decrease the font size. OK, so whoops. Uh, what was not clear when I elided over this, which I did because I was worried about time, is that each of the, so for, in the ca current case, you have CentOS and Ubuntu. CentOS and Ubuntu tasks each run, and they deposit something in a workspace. The workspace is shared with the upload task, and then the upload task just uploads the tarballs to uh, an S3 bucket. Uh, specified in the bottom of this is the, basically the relationship between each of the tasks. And as you can see here, um, the tasks are also filtered on only certain branches, so we only look at the master branch. And the, the jobs that get executed are um, as follows. Oh, wait, that's for, that's for builders. So we have also builders, which is something you don't need to worry about. Uh, no one should use that. That's actually, so builders is a hack to make it so that I don't have to always reinstall everything when generating a new cpan file and a new cpan file.snapshot. Um, but in the your, in, in a ideal situation, you will only have one environment, and you won't have different environments to do. Kate, by the way, if you are doing this, uh, as of last week, CentOS 7, when you are installing it on, uh, when you are using it on CircleCI, will break because of some bug in the way they're running Docker. So if you, if you need to do a yum update in a CentOS 7 environment, you should do that and build your own Docker, uh, put, build that, name it, and upload it to Docker Hub and use that, because running the yum update inside CircleCI will just crash. But there's everything. These, uh, I actually kept the existing, when I did this, I kept the existing CI uh, Docker container around, which was called BMO CI. Uh, I basically had no interruption of service while doing this. We just turned off, eventually turned off the old CI and turned on the new CI. Um, but all of that can go away now as well. So there's really just three containers in play, three build processes in, in play in here. Uh, if there are no other questions, then I think I am going to be done. There's literally no other questions.
No other questions about the Dockerfile language either.